I've got 20 tips, tricks, and shortcuts for you to work more speedy and efficiently in Revit. Learning Revit is hard enough, so don't do it by yourself. In my new Revit beginners course, you'll learn Revit in a fast, fun and easy way by actually modeling up a real three-story residential project. If you want to get on board, check out the link in my description and I'll see you there. Now let's get on with these 20 Revit hacks. Tip number one is about using work sets. Work sets are a collaboration tool inside Revit used to help organize your file. Go up to collaborate, click work sets. Here you'll be starting up work sharing inside your Revit file. Now you don't have to be collaborating with others to use work sets, but this is what you'll be doing. You can move all the levels and grids to a work set, which is fine. And you can move the remaining um, elements to a work set. We can just call this work set because the end game of this is to have all of your walls on a layer to have all of your roofs on a layer and all of your, let's say plumbing or services, stuff like that, so that you can easily just hide them in your whole project rather than filtering out all of your walls and then clicking hide and view, which is a terrible way to go about this. What you can do is just tick off the work sets and it will hide it across the entire project. Because this is just a beginner's video, we won't touch too much more on work sets, but that's all you need to know about it, that you can hide things across your entire project, which is the much more proper and efficient way to do things inside of Revit, especially when working across um, different disciplines inside the industry. Now, how annoying is it when you're working in a project and then you accidentally click on a door or something and that loads up the family? This is something that can really screw up your workflow. You might be modeling along and then you accidentally double click on something and it just screws you over. So there's a way to change what double clicking on an element actually does and you can change it so that it doesn't open up this view because if you double click on a really intricate family that is highly detailed, it can really slow down your modeling process. So let's find out how to do that. If you go to file and go down to options, you can find user interface down here. Then you can see double click options. If we customize this and we want to change this to either edit type or do nothing. If you do nothing, it won't do anything when you double click on an element. Otherwise, if you do edit type, then it will bring up the edit type screen, which is less resource heavy than actually opening up the family. So that might be a better way to do it, but I'm gonna click do nothing. While we're on this screen, you can also see that there are keyboard shortcuts. Now it's really good to familiarize yourself with the keyboard shortcuts inside of Revit. It will take a little bit to get used to as with any software, but once you have all of the shortcuts in the back of your mind, it will be like knowing another language, um, but they will really speed up your processes inside of Revit and it will really speed up your workflow. And the cool thing is you can actually customize these to be whatever you want. So if you've come from AutoCAD or if you've come from working in SketchUp or Rhino, you can easily change things to mimic what they were in those programs so that you don't have to learn a completely different tool set. The next tip is talking about selecting things because quite often it's difficult to select what we want to select. In the bottom right hand corner, you have different selection tools. You've got select links, which allows you to select links and their elements, select underlay elements, which allows you to select underlay elements and so forth. You can also see some other things here. The biggest one is the filter tool. You can highlight everything. And if say you just want to select these columns, then you can click filter, check none, and then we can go to, there should be columns here, but since I've grouped them, they're under model groups. So we can click on that and click okay. Now those columns are the only things that are selected because let's say if we wanted to nudge these and we've selected something over here, then you're moving things that you don't want to move. You can also see that drag elements on selection is an option here. Usually you want this disabled because if you're dragging things when you're trying to select stuff, that can be really painful and you can accidentally move things. So it's best to have this disabled. The next tip is about trying to snap to objects. So let's say I wanted to snap to the middle of this column with this wall. Now you can try and go through this and you can hit tab to try and select different things. And that can be quite problem problematic. That can be quite annoying. And you can try and you know zoom in and then really get to that center point, which is you know cool. But the better way to do it is with shortcuts. There are snapping shortcuts, which you can use to easily snap to things. So to do that, it's always going to start with S and then you want to hit the next button. Say if you want to snap to the midpoint, all you'd have to do is click S M and then now it only snaps to midpoints, which is very handy rather than trying to snap to other things. And then you might accidentally lock onto something 
that you don't want to lock onto. You can also use snap to endpoint, snap to intersection, uh, snap to center, and then also snap to tangent, etc., etc. And it's always going to be starting with S, and then if it's to endpoint, it would be SE. If it's to intersection, SI, and so forth. The next tip is freaking huge. If you've ever wanted to do real-time rendering inside of Revit or inside of a 3D modeling program, it's really simple with Enscape. And this isn't a sponsor or anything. It's free for students, which is freaking awesome. I use this for pretty much all my projects in uni. Every workplace I've interned in at the moment also use this program so it's ex it's extremely good and it's the industry standard at the moment for real-time rendering let me show you how to use it so it's a plugin once you've installed it inside of revit which is extremely simple you can go up to the top uh, ribbon tab here and you can go to enscape and you just start inside usually you want to be inside a 3d view this isn't just really good for creating quick renders that you might want to show a client or you might want to show your tutors or your um, professor or whoever you're showing your project too. It's really good for that, but I also use it mainly as a design tool because now what you can do is fly around your model in a people perspective, if that makes sense. You are now the height of a human and you can actually walk around your model and see what the spaces are like for a human, which is what architecture is all about. It's about designing to human scale. And it's really hard to do that when you're just working in 2D elevations, plans and sections, so forth. So this is a great tool for actually exploring your design. And you can see that there are some materials overlaying here, which is creating some problems if I were to render this. And you can actually you know, see what materials look like next to each other. You can see that this is extruding through the wall, which isn't meant to happen. So it's extremely good for doing that. It can be a bit slow if you uh, have a really big model. Where's my door? <laughs> I've got to find the right door. But it is extremely awesome. And if you add a ground to this, you add some trees, there's a whole asset library that comes with Enscape. You can create some really nice looking renders really quickly and easily. So let's get out of that. Next up, we've got uh, placing objects, which is you know, might be thinking that's pretty easy to do. But there's a little quick tip here. So let's say we wanted to load in a family. I'm just going to load in anything here. So then let's say I wanted to load in this chair. We go to architecture, component, place a component. Quite often I see a lot of students then placing this in and then having to rotate it with the rotate tool into where they want to put it. Another way to do that is by pressing space when placing a component and that's going to rotate it. But then let's say you wanted to place it adjacent or parallel to a curve, which is pretty difficult to do because it's only rotating 90 degrees. Let's say I wanted it to follow along this line here. If you hover over that line and click space, you can see that it now is following that path. So you can place the chair and it's going to be following that path, which is awesome if you've got a curved wall and you wanna place some stuff around that wall. The next thing is being able to lock a 3D view because it's so annoying when I'm trying to set up a 3D view, like a camera for a render or something, and then I accidentally bump it and then it's no longer in the right spot. So to change that, to lock that view into how you want it to be, you can actually use the 3D lock tool. And that's just this tool down the bottom here. If you click on that and you go save orientation and lock view, you can name it. Oh, that's so annoying. Um, you can name it and then um, now there's no way to orbit around that. You can still move in and out and you can still pan around, but you can't actually orbit around this model, which is going to make it really easy to keep that view that you wanted. And if you want to unlock it, you just press that button again and click unlock view. So when hiding or isolating things inside your 3D model, it's not a great practice. It's not good practice to hide things in a view. The better way to do it is by using the visibility or visibility graphics settings by pressing VV or VG, I believe it is. And what you can actually do is turn off different components from this master uh, override, I guess you could say. So let's say I wanted to turn off the roof rather than going here and then hiding these in the view by going hide in view category or elements. The best way to do it is by coming to VV or VG and then you can press R to go down to roofs and you can untick that and click OK. Now this is view dependent, so it's only gonna change it in this view. If I go to an east elevation, those roofs are still there. But if I wanted to turn that off again, press VV, go to R, click roofs, and you can hide that in that view. Really simple for hiding things in a view. It's much better practice than 
then having to go into here and find what you've done with those things. So in this elevation, you can see we've changed the view to be realistic and we've set up a pretty nice looking elevation. But then if we go to, I'm gonna guess our south one, it doesn't look as good. What you can do to bring those settings over to this elevation, rather than having to change all of this manually, what you can do is set up a template. And these are really good. These are used quite often in architecture practices. It's a good habit to get into using templates because you don't want to have to change the settings of all of your elevations manually or all your sections manually. You want to be able to just apply a template to it, which then sets up that view. Now, I'll be honest, I haven't done too much of this as a student <laughs> for all my student projects. I usually take the hard and long way. So definitely get into this practice of setting up templates. I don't have any setup that I can show you. How you can find templates is by going into the properties to the side here, clicking view template and then you can usually set up one. See, there's already some set up for elevations, site sections, etc. And you can click OK, and that's going to apply that view template. Now, nothing's changed because we haven't set this up, but by changing these, you can change the override um, stuff from here. So you could turn off all the walls, or you could change the wall settings from here, and you can apply this across all of the different elevations, which is really, really cool, really easy to manipulate your drawings. All the architecture practices I've worked out have templates set up for ground floor plans and for elevations, sections, site plans, so that every time you start a new project, it's very easy to just apply templates to your drawings. And every time you start a new drawing, apply that template. The next tip, this is a quick one. If we were to edit this footprint, let's say in the ground bathroom view, um, let's say we wanted it to go to the inside of these walls rather than drawing around with the line tool, which is cool. It might not be perfect. What you can do instead is use the pick line tool. You might already know about this, but this just picks lines inside your drawing. And you can usually do this for AutoCAD files and stuff like that as well that you've inserted into your model. And it's just going to make it really easy to follow along. It's not always perfect as you can see. Now we've got overla uh, overlapping lines. Um, but it's a really cool tool and if you've got curves and stuff like that rather than trying to redraw those curves You can use the pick line tool. This next tip is to not drag elements It's you know not a great practice to get into instead you want to input numbers So say I want this to be 50 mils off the wall. That's a good way to do it Otherwise using the align tool and I've just clicked a L there to bring up that align tool Which is the shortcut otherwise you can find it up in the modify panel and by clicking what you want to align to first and then clicking what you want to align that to, then you can bring that over and they are now perfectly in line rather than trying to manually drag that over in line with it, which can be quite difficult to do. The next thing is constraining to levels or just constraining in general. What you can actually do is constrain elements inside your project to be constrained to levels or constrained to other walls, things like that, so that when you move that wall, it's going to move everything else that's constrained to it. And this keeps things in proportion. This makes sure that things stay in the right spot, but it can also mean that if you have too many constraints, it can cause errors and problems. So you wanna be um, kind of smart about the way you use constraints. I use constraints mainly for levels. So if I have walls going up to a certain level, rather than putting my walls offset, say 4,000 off of the ground or something like that, what I'll do is I'll attach it to a level. And this happened in the beginner's course. I realized that the floor was not at the correct height. And so all of my walls, when I changed that floor height, were still stuck in the same place. And so then I, I would usually have to adjust all of those walls up to meet that level again. But instead, I've just constrained it to that level so that the floor is constrained to the level and I just change the level and it's gonna bring down that floor, it's gonna bring down those walls just by changing the level because they are all constrained to that level. This next tip is if you want to copy some objects across from different views. You can use Control C or Command C to copy, say this door over to another, um, another view. Then it's also difficult to try and line things up. What you can do instead is use Control C and then say if we went to level one, what you can do is go paste, align to selected levels. You can align it to the exact same place. You can align it to the current view. By clicking select levels, you can then apply this selection and copy it across multiple levels. This is really good if you're doing say like an uh, office building, 
you can just design one floor level and then copy that across all of the different levels that you want to paste that to rather than having to model in say 18 different levels. This next tip is a big one because if you don't follow this and you're working with others, you're collaborating with others or even just working by yourself, it can really fuck a lot of things up. So whenever you're creating a new type or you're changing a material or something like this, you wanna duplicate it first. So let's say we wanted to change this wall and we wanted it to be 250 mils in width. If we were to just change this structure to be say 110, and this is going to change this to okay 290 that's going to change all of the walls in this model that have that material or type applied to it instead what you want to do is you would undo that and then duplicate it and then create a new type which is 290 mils and this can get you know pretty busy then when you're looking at all your wall types but that is the correct way to do it because you don't want to be changing stuff that you've previously set up inside the model or changing things that you don't know you're changing because that can create really hair pulling stressful situations. This next thing is just a time saver. If I'm say opening up a new family, most of the time it starts in the documents section. But then if I wanted to get to entourage, look at this file path. It's extremely long and annoying trying to get to the library. So what I would do instead you can just, let's say I wanted the Australian library to be on this side panel here. You can just drag this, whoops, you can just drag this and move it to the side. Now all you have to do is click Australia and it's going to bring that up. So when it starts here in documents, you don't have to go to you know my computer and then find where all your stuff is. You can just click Australia, super, super easy. This is something I've only just started utilizing, but let's say you're in a 3D view and you wanted to look at this top down what you can do is use the view cube, which I never really used them back in the day, but now I found it's really super helpful. And you can click top and it's going to bring this into a top view. So then let's say, I'm just gonna hide this in view. You wanted to work on this in a 3D view and then you wanted to look at it still in 3D, you can do that. You don't have to create a ground floor plan for it or go to a roof plan. You can do that inside your 3D view and whatever you have selected, if you click on that, it's going to zoom into that. So then also you can look at this in an elevation view and you can bring this around to the right or the left and you can just look at it in a 2D mode still in a 3D view. You might be wondering why that's useful now, but trust me, as you're working along in a 3D view, you're going to use this quite often. While we're in the 3D view, using section boxes is massive. So let's say you wanted to, I don't know, work on this door inside of here. It's going to be really hard to try and work on that in a 3D view. You can work on it, say, in the ground floor plan, or this would be on the level one floor plan. But what you can do is use section boxes. Now, a section box is going to just isolate this from everything else, pretty much. And you can go up to the modified tab and click section box, or you can see that the shortcut for that is BX. So if we press that, it's going to zoom into that and isolate everything else around it very very helpful you can actually adjust this section box from inside this 3d view by clicking on the section box and then pulling out these little buttons to the side here it's a very easy and quick way to manipulate your 3d views and you can also create some cool views with a section box and to turn it on it's just by pressing this button here if you want to turn it off there you go and if you turn the section box back on now it's not going to isolate that again. It's going to create a new section box around everything visible in that view. So there we have it. That's what I think was probably 20 tips and tricks for Revit beginners. I hope you found that helpful. If you want to check out the, the beginners Revit course, I highly recommend it. It's going to be much easier and quicker to learn Revit by following along with this project that I have. You can find all the course files and the materials that I use and the families inside the course on my website. Otherwise, if you want to watch it for free, it is also on YouTube. It's just you don't get the luxury of finding um, all the project files and following along, which is really that key thing to get you learning Revit quickly and easily. So I'll see you in that course. Thank you so much for watching. Take care.